So the coolest job in a tech company is designing new products. Uh, you always see that photo of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak in the garage building a new computer, and everybody knows Sir James Dyson and his vacuum. But invention doesn't always involve getting struck by lightning. I've seen the development of products from kitchen appliances to medical devices, uh, both as an engineer and as a consultant. Now, when it comes to products, you've used just as many as I have from the remote control with too many buttons, or the tea kettle with a terrible whistle, or even the selfie stick that pours beer in your mouth for taking your photo. You wanna develop a product yourself, either to bring in a few hundred dollars a month, or maybe you've got the next million dollar idea with uh, carbon fiber socks. All right, so we're still working on the idea, but these tips from my experience in product development will help you a lot. So today I'm gonna to go through need finding, market analysis, and some brainstorming tips from Stanford professors, the ones that started IDEO. Plus, I'm gonna go into a little bit of business analysis to determine whether your product idea actually makes sense. Even if you don't have the perfect idea yet, there's some tried and tested ways to come up with new products. Before we dive into these powerful strategies, I wanna just give you a short disclaimer. First is that I have not made and sold my own multi-million dollar product, I've done it for other companies. And secondly, making physical products is hard. I'm not gonna cover everything about that in this video, but it's a really good start. First thing I wanna talk about is how to utilize the immersion principle. You really need to know your ideal customer before designing for them. And that means observing them. And I'm not talking about watching a Twitch stream or tuning into somebody's YouTube video. You really need to see people in their natural environment. So the first step in this is figuring out who your ideal customer is. Maybe it's a college student or maybe it's a video gamer. Then the second step is you go and find that person. Maybe you have a friend of a friend. Maybe you gotta go to the video game store and talk to one of the retail clerks there. So when you watch your ideal customer, you wanna look for their pain points. Uh, what things upset them, what activities make them grimace. You wanna really figure out what are the problems that they face in their day to day. Be sure not to ask leading questions when you're inquiring further about some kind of problem. You don't wanna say, wouldn't your feet feel better in carbon fiber socks? Instead ask, how do your feet feel? Uh, and then when you find a point of concern, you wanna dig deeper. Use phrases like, tell me more about. The well-known quote attributed to Henry Ford goes something like, if I asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. But eventually, even Ford caved in to the customer demands, and while the first round of Fords were all black, they eventually made a lot of different colors and a lot of different styles, and the cars sold really well. You've started the process by observing and engaging with your customer. The next thing to do is solve a problem by finding a need. You've probably heard the term human-centered design before but did you know that they came up with it in World War II? The Air Force needed to figure out why 15,000 airmen had died during training. So they hired a psychologist to come in and study the behavior patterns of the pilots and to see what problems they faced in the airplane. You know what they found out? It came down to the control panel design. They couldn't tell the difference between the wing flaps and the landing gear, and the result was a crash landing. They had a lot of problems just because of the lack of user-centered design. Working with pilots, the US Air Force was able to understand the experience better and make a better control panel. They made it easier to touch the right buttons and made it harder to use the wrong buttons. The foundation of user-centered design is empathy. So you need to meet your customer in their daily environment and then interact with them and ask them simple questions. When you engage with people in their natural settings, you can uncover issues that they didn't even know about. The best feeling is when you can voice a need to someone that they hadn't even said out loud yet. Now, remember to get out of the lab. One nice rule of thumb in user research is this interview at least five, but no more than 12 customers. At some point, you're just hearing the same answers over and over. If you've had success with larger or smaller groups, let me know in the comments. But for me, at a certain point, I just wanna go make some solution, ask for their feedback on that, rather than getting more interviews and more feedback. So we're going through the process from observe to engage, and now we're at immerse. The last step is to immerse yourself in the environment of your user so you can understand their problem. The best solutions come from the best insights into human behavior. A great way to come up with solutions is to get help from others. You wanna frame the problem clearly and then get two or three people to help you come up with solutions. You wanna practice the improv technique of saying yes and to others. What if you could levitate? Yes and, maybe we could use magnets to do that. So there are two phases in a brainstorm and you wanna cycle between the two. The first is to flare 
And the second is to focus. So you wanna go wide with your ideas and then you wanna define the problem more clearly. Once you have a little more focus, you can use that frame to go wide again. What are people buying? I hope I've convinced you the best products actually solve a problem. And if it's a real problem, people already have your solution. What would your ideal customer, the one you talked to earlier, do facing that problem today? The answer to that is your competition. And if you can't find your competition, there are two explanations. One is you need to look harder, or two is there's no market. If it's not a real problem, nobody's solved it. So maybe there is no market. You might have identified something before anyone else knows it's even a problem. If you're adamant about sticking with it, be prepared for an uphill battle. Apple built a handheld computing device in 1993 called the Newton, and that couldn't even fit in the huge cargo pocket of your pants. When it failed to get enough market attention, Apple walked away for 10 years until they released the iPhone when the technology and the market were ready. That'll fit really nicely in your skinny jeans. It's much harder to convince the world that they need your gadgets than it is to pick another product to develop. Oftentimes, we're the worst judges of our own ideas, and you just need to kill your darling so you can move on to a better idea. If the product that your competition exists and is sold online, there are tons of ways to find out how many of them are selling on Amazon right now. The Amazon sales calculator is something you could Google and find the most current one. If the competitor is from a big name brand, your, your path is going to be a difficult one. Even a competitor with a gibberish name like Yokozu or Kazopu or Hovamp is going to be tough to beat if their product has thousands of reviews. So it's really important to evaluate how big the market is. You might have 10 million customers, you might have a thousand customers. And if you're trying to reach 5% of them with 10 million, that's 500,000. If you only have a thousand customers, 5% of them is 50 people. So you really wanna pick a larger market size. Did you invent a new magic trick? Congratulations, there's a huge market. Did you come up with a new mallet for bike polo? Well, I'm sorry, that's a very small market. And how do I know? From Google search trends, you can look up and see search volume. And I see there's a hundred times as many people looking for magic trick as there are looking for bike polo. Looking at high performance socks on Google search trends, I actually see a decline in performance, but carbon fiber is up. So there's still hope for our carbon fiber socks. It's still possible. All right, you wanna know if it makes sense to build your product. A good rule of thumb is you should aim for a million dollars in revenue with one product. That justifies the development costs, the investment of time, and everything that goes into it. If you're doing it as one person, a million dollars. If you wanna have a five or 10 person company, maybe you aim for five products that bring in a million dollars each. So as you're thinking about whether or not it makes business sense, there are a few different variables. You want to think about timeline. How long do you have before you need to be making money? Maybe you have six months of runway, as they call it, or maybe you need to sell a product tomorrow. You got to pick a way simpler product if you need to ship it tomorrow. But if you have six months or a year, you can really develop and invest in your research. And that way you're going to have a leg up on the competition. You're going to be way ahead of them. The second question is your product offering model. Are you gonna sell something direct to consumers? Are you gonna have it at a retail store? Uh, are you just gonna take it to events and showcases and sell it yourself? All of those have different margins and requirements you gotta think about. Not just what's the margin to sell it on your own website uh, and how much do you have to pay each person, but for a retail location, you have to have really nice packaging. You need to put a lot into what it looks like on a shelf. Probably need some designers. There's some support to go into that. Uh, so lastly, there's a question about your research and development budget, your R&D budget. If you can invest in products and develop them over time, you're gonna have a lot better chance of beating the competition, especially if you're able to invest in a few different products because maybe one of them doesn't pan out. Maybe something when you develop it, you make some prototypes, put it in front of people, they're not that excited and that's okay. Now that we've explained need finding, a little bit of market analysis and some brainstorming tips from those Stanford professors. Uh, we're ready to move on to designing your product and actually making your first proof of concept. So roll up your sleeves and let's keep going. What you wanna do is take your idea and carry it through the testing process. You wanna take a problem that you identify and learn from a real customer and figure out what can you provide to solve that problem and then test it, get out in the world, put it in front of people and get their real feedback. And I think through this, you can really validate your ideas. You can really develop some new products and I hope this helps you out.